All this is Dr. Mobin Sayed. Welcome to one more show. So uh, today I had an interview with Weird Sauce, Florence from Weird Sauce. Let me very quickly show you her website. Uh, a very intellectual host today. Great talk. This is her website. There have been great um, uh, guests there. I'm honored to be there as well. So we had that talk today from 4 to about 5.17 or so. And so I didn't get enough chance to develop a lecture. So for me, it is not just the lecture and saying things. I like to draw them as well. So I thought I will continue with the chit chat from yesterday. That way, at least I can uh, engage with you instead of being absent. So my apologies for this. But we would continue with the discussion about the vaccine hesitancy and the various reasons and try to see whatever reasons we can answer for. There are things that I cannot answer for them, but there are things that I can explain and hopefully help someone make a decision. So with this, uh, the other sad news today, but not all is lost. So judge denies request for injunction that would have allowed EVMS doctor to prescribe ivermectin at Centera Hospital. So I think that there is a bunch of uh, incorrect way of putting it from the media. And that is that ivermectin is not the sole medicine or even the primary medicine that was in the, in the case. But anyways, media writes it with ivermectin here, which kind of Maybe from their point of view, it is easier for people to recognize what the issue is about, although the issue is about off-label use instead of ivermectin. And the second thing is maybe this way they can help uh, make people feel a little less happy about this and say, well, yeah, sure, ivermectin. So, yeah, sure, whatever is happening is right. So I think there is a um, less than correct approach by the media. But anyways... The temporary injunction was denied. And on top of that, hospital has suspended Dr. Marek as well for 14 days. So I think their case would continue. The trial would continue after this. So it's not that everything is lost, but there is an initial setback here. So that is sad to see. Um, according to the judge, that was very interesting what he said. He said that, um, this one. So Merrick's attorney said he thinks the court's ruling shows the judge wants more information on informed consent. In the judge's opinion, the judge said that Merrick's position that doctors should be able to demand hospital hospitals support their alternative treatment. So again, this alternative treatment, even if the hospital believes they are unsafe, doesn't appear to fall under Virginia's informed consent law and could set a dangerous precedent. So that is the uh, discussion, not the... Anyways, there is a setback in the beginning. So let's go back to the discussions about the vaccine-related questions. So I will continue to toss between the live questions here and some questions here. William, I saw your questions and they are too many of them. So if I just kept answering them, it would just keep going for a long time. So I'm going to pick up some more parts from your question and answer them. And then we'll continue with other as well, just to provide, you know, fair opportunity to others too. So back here, we had discussed yesterday um, LNP part. Then the Dr. Larry Quack warned that BC because mRNA protein expresses is expressed is modified by host, host cell after translation it carries theoretical autoimmunity risk mechanism is here C step five his article unfortunately was published on right wing so let's quickly look at it so the the comment here by William is that if messenger RNA based vaccines are given and the messenger RNA itself can become an antigen for our body so our immune system would attack messenger rna and then tomorrow attack our own rnas as well and that would cause an autoimmune disease so here is the um 
article that William has suggested. Mechanism number five, somewhere over here. I read this part here. So let me explain what they are saying and explain how this may be. So what they're saying here is the current data do not indicate that there is any induction of Im immunogenicity against IBT mRNA itself. However, so the first statement is that they do not see from the current data that the messenger RNA that is given from, let's say, outside, our body develops, a, you know, immune response to it. So let me quickly draw that as well. So what we are saying is, or what that article is saying, that let's say here is a cell, and the cell, there is a lipid nanoparticle, and the lipid nanoparticle has messenger RNA. This lipid nanoparticle goes into the cell, messenger RNA is then removed, that messenger RNA is picked up by a ribosome, and then it is translated. When the messenger RNA is picked up by ribosome, normally on the rough endoplasmic reticulum, and the protein is formed from it, that process is called translation. So translation occurs, and from this recipe, a protein is formed. For example, in the case of messenger RNA uh, pro, uh, vaccines, the spike protein is formed. Now they're saying that so far the data does not show that our immune system cells start attacking this messenger RNA itself. And if they attack the messenger RNA, for example, let's say messenger RNA leaked out and the immune system cell looked at it. And so if I can change this guy's eye, imagine this is a, a macrophage. So if I can change his eyes and now he's looking at it, and if he attacks it, then it is possible that this messenger RNA looks like our RNA, which will be difficult because we are saying this is spike protein RNA, and ideally it should not look like RNA. But anyways, let's say a small part of it looks like RNA, then the immune system is now attacking something which may have a part that look like our RNA, then this immune system would start attacking our RNAs as well, and we would develop an autoimmune disease. This is the basic concept that is the worry. So now check this out. They say that we do not have this proof so far. However, mounting evidence suggests that patient with systemic lupus erythematosus, SLE, it's an autoimmune disease, and other autoimmune diseases can develop anti-self RNA or antibodies. So antibodies, that is the attacking chemical substances from our cells that would start attacking our own RNA. So they're saying there is evidence mounting. Thus, under certain circumstances, such as long-term repetitive systemic application of mRNA, anti-RNA autoantibodies may potentially form and mediate immune pathology. So that what they're saying is, maybe if we started using messenger RNA again and again for various reasons, various gene therapies, for various other therapies, for various, as a drug more commonly, or let's say the boosters, although I don't believe boosters have high enough frequency to do this, but anyways, let's say boosters, something in which mRNA is repetitively given, then it is possible that at some point our immune system becomes upset with this RNA and start attacking our own RNA as well because of molecular mimicry, because of some pattern that is similar, and that is how we could, we could develop uh, autoantibodies. This is a situation which happens with even other drug molecules. For example, I think sometimes uh, penicillin could trigger uh, molecular mimicry. Other drugs could trigger molecular mimicry. Other viruses could trigger molecular mimicry, which would then cause production of self-antigens or self-antibodies. So in theory, could this happen? Yes. So would we have to look at it? We will have to look at it with repeated application. Now, how repeated is repeated? Your body actually becomes upset. For example, 
how many times do I need to take penicillin for the body to finally say, I don't like it. It has become matched to some molecule in my body or some pattern in my body and I'm going to attack it. Mostly it's going to be a rare possibility if this happens. But anyways, that is a theory. So William, I understand the theory. I don't think that at the moment there is any mechanism that shows that somehow our body looks at the messenger RNA for the spike protein and then finds a pattern that is for our RNA and then start creating self-autoantibodies. So good theoretical question. I don't know how practical it will be, but I understand your concern. I'm going to answer one more uh, thing here. Number two, risk management. If one's baseline risk is near zero due to work circumstances, lifestyle, and both vaccine and COVID risk is not zero, one of, of course inclines to, to wait. Furthermore, Novavax and Paxlovid has much lower risk upper bound than messenger RNA due to mechanism. So this is a discussion which is theoretically correct. That, and I deliberately use the word theoretical and I would respond to my own word in a second or clarify that. So yes, we can say that the chances of infection are less, but then when infection happens, the chances of hospitalization are less, then death are less, and so recovery rate is great and so on. However, there still is a chance of death. And what we do not know is who will be the victim. We do not know the profile, genetic makeup, body's makeup that would that would predispose someone to have a negative outcome. So because of that, for example, when I took vaccine, for me, what was more important was that I don't know, even today after taking the vaccine, I do not know if I got COVID, how will my body respond and will I end up having cytokine storm or not? My hope is that with vaccine, that chance has reduced further. That means, did I take a risk with the vaccine as well? Yes. Now, fortunate that I didn't develop much side effects or at all, but my wife developed, many other people are developing. Um, so yes, there is a risk there as well, but this was my thinking pattern. So again, I'm not asking anyone to adapt the thinking, but I'm trying to explain the risk analysis over here. So correct, if you said, hey, I am in that group, let's say young group without comorbidities, where if I got the, the infection, I think I'll be fine, then that is also a, an analysis on your end to say, if I get the vaccine and I may have issues versus if I get the infection and I may have issues, but the risk seem to me to be okay, then that is your choice. I personally do also believe that creating mandates like Austria or I, um, many other countries are putting mandates up as well. That is a little harder. The question for us all to think intellectually is what is the way to figure out how do we start protecting ourselves um, in in one discussion and this is a very common uh, stance as well that if vaccine is protective then why do folks who are vaccinated for example me are saying that somebody else should not be unvaccinated or everybody should be vaccinated to protect me. Why? If I have been vaccinated and vaccine is supposed to already protect me. So there is, these are logical discussions to have. I don't think that society is having those discussions or even at this time tolerating to have those discussions. For example, when I discuss these things, I am at a risk of getting my channel shut down. I already have a strike. If they gave me two more strikes, they would shut down the channel. So that means this dialogue itself can be just stopped. And I do not see any reasonable place where this dialogue can occur because it is similar um, containment everywhere. So anyways, 
very good thoughts, William. Now I'm going to go to one more question on, on Twitter and then I'll come back to the live site. This question was interesting, interesting as well. And this was in that thread, I separately took it out. This is Stefan Koribo says, this is an honest question and I don't trust many people. If I take the jab, my body will produce the same spike protein as the virus. It will cause an immune response. If I take a PCR test, won't the test be positive since I have has this spike and immune response? So good one. And somebody responded and said the test looks at the virus, not the spike protein. Two different things. So I'm going to explain this one part. And then uh, this is a good question. So let me explain this and then, then I'll come to the live side. So very, very good question, actually, uh, from Stefan. Stefan, thank you. So here is the mechanism. First of all, let's look at the mechanism for, <laughs> I'm going to try to make an open mouth. Right, so here, let's say, is throat somewhere over here. Or here is the nose. <laughs> A little crooked, but oh well, go with me. So what we are doing is we are saying, please take a swab, correct? Take a swab and have that swab, you know, move it in your nostril or or nasopharyngeal area, depending upon who is taking it and what is the test kit's be, uh, need. But we are taking some material from here. That is one, that is PCR. So in this test, what we are doing is we are saying, pick up the virus pieces, especially the RNA of the virus. And then we look at the viral RNA pieces and look at that pattern. So we, we are actually not looking at the virus itself. So let's say here is the virus. And the virus has various things, nucleocapsid proteins and M proteins and spike proteins. And there is a, uh, there is a super chat and I'm gonna reach to that in a second. I hope I don't miss it. The super chat says, with the mRNA vaccine, if you take the two initial shots, but do not take the boosters, one to two years after, will there be any benefit from the vaccine? Short answer is yes from the way immune system behaves. If somebody said to me that prove it, I cannot because we have not seen it in reality in two years. But from the books I have been sharing and from the mechanisms that we have been knowing, even from the previous SARS-CoV-1, we know that the durability of the immunity goes on for a long time. So... In short, my opinion, yes, but don't take that for a for a decision making. The deterministic answer will be once we have that data. So I'm saying it without the data. I'm saying it with mechanism and with the previous information in the books. Okay, so back here, PCR is not looking at the virus itself, but pieces of RNA, which we can amplify. So what happens is this is what PCR is we amplify, right? So we take pieces of RNA, we make copies of them, we duplicate them, then we take this duplicate and duplicate it again, and then duplicate it again, and that is called the PCR cycle. And that is how we can keep duplicating the genetic material. This is why we cannot duplicate the virus itself. We can only duplicate the genetic material because we can do this with the genetic material. These are just bases and we can make copies of the bases. So PCR would detect the fragments of the RNA. Now you could say that, hey, the which fragments of RNA? And most of the test kits are actually going to look at the part of RNA that gives rise to various parts of spike protein. So you could say, aha, we got it. If somebody had the spike protein vaccine, which is also RNA, then that could be picked up by a PCR as well as a virus. The, you could be correct, but the only 
difference is that in case of the vaccine, vaccine does not, so far, I'm not talking about nasal and other vaccines, I'm talking about intramuscular. Vaccine goes to the deltoid muscle, correct? And because it goes to deltoid muscle, it will be the RNA, the lipid nanoparticle, will be picked up by these cells here. And then they would be making spike protein here, and then they would be presenting that spike protein to the local lymph nodes, and then the whole war and inflammation and training would occur here. Could a vaccine create a positive PCR? I'm going to give you a hypothetical mechanism, which in reality is not possible. So I'm going to tell you how many things need to be done to make it positive. So short answer, it will not happen. Longer answer, if you want to make it happen, what would that entail? That would mean we need to bring the spike RNA here. Now, our body is not a bag where something can swim from one place to another. We are a very complex set of structures and fluid streams and blood vessels and tissues. And so things cannot just go from one place to another. Even within a cell, things cannot go from one place to another because the cell itself is like a three-dimensional city with the roads in it and things have to get a cab, <laughs> the, the uh, dianines and, and the other kinins or kinosins, proteins that would bring a thing from one place to another place, even within a cell. So expecting something to go from here to throat, what will be needed? So number one, we have a lipid nanoparticle in the deltoid. From there, that lipid nanoparticle or messenger RNA, something, need to go all the way to the throat. That means from the muscle, it has to go to lymph. From the lymph, so first it has to be escaping the muscle tissue and the local cells which would either pick it up if they are immune cells or pick it up if they are other cells. So it has to escape them all, then go to the local lymph node. From the lymph node, it also has to escape the whole army there, which is just looking for antigens and can pick it up. From the lymph, then it has to go into the heart because lymph eventually returned to heart. So then from the heart, this intact lipid nanoparticle has to carry the messenger RNA or the messenger RNA piece has to travel from the heart. It has to go to the carotid arteries. These are the arteries that are coming from heart and the side of the neck. From there, they have to eventually reach the blood supply of the throat area. Then from there, the lipid nanoparticle or the messenger RNA has to jump out of the blood system and then it has to accumulate here which then hair or hair or nose, which would then need to be picked up by the PCR stick and then amplified as a positive test case. So that all is such a complex journey that for an LN, LNP, intact LNP, carrying an mRNA all the way to throat is not possible. Why I showed that is to explain how much of the journey has to be taken to do this. Okay, so some questions there. Now I'm going to come to the live side. How is everyone doing here? Okay, so Kira, Kira Shrem says, theoretically, which one first in acute infection, colchicine or fluvoxamine, Jalali and Demelo both compelling, which one first, then second? So I am not a fan of Colchicin. I have never given it to my patients. So for me to talk about Colchicin, I do not know. If you ask Dr. Demelo, he's going to say Colchicin. Now, fluvoxamine, I have only used it if at all the patient develops any neurological issues. So for me, that is also not the first line drug. Although now we have uh, RCT that showed fluvoxamine is helpful and so could be used, but I have not used it. So I could not say. If you, I think if you would ask Dr. Jalali, he would say fluvoxamine. If you ask Demelo, he would say Colchicine. Uh, 
So Arubaga, thank you very much for your generous donation. I can become expert in one disease, but obvious I cannot do it for all diseases. That is true for all of us. Even doctors, when they are practicing, they will become expert in an area. Nipa says, Kalchasin, I have used. Okay, so. Okay, so Carlos Ortiz has a question. So what's your take on J&J and J&J booster versus two mRNA shots for 32-year-old male? especially regarding the possibility of heart issues and strokes. I live alone, so if I get a stroke, it's game over for me. So, <clears throat> Carlos, you know that I cannot give a direct advice. So I can only talk in more conceptual way. I cannot give you an advice. I'm not your doctor, you're not my patient. And even if you were doctor-patient, it is unethical to sit in public and do this discussion. I'll give a more theoretical understanding or my opinion part of it that I would, for example, my wife had J&J. Um, number one, I think that J&J should have been two-dose vaccine. Good it is not two-dose vaccine because now it is one dose and a booster instead of two doses and a booster. That's one. Second, J&J in men, youngsters, have been generally fine. Its efficacy is slightly lesser than Moderna and Pfizer, but generally it has been fine. It is women under 50 where it has caused more trouble because of the platform or adenovirus or adjuvant, whatever that thing is. So generally for males, younger males, one shot, efficacy is less, Booster from the CDC for j and is that after two months of the j and one is eligible for the boosters. I generally am a little hesitant with the adenoviruses. I like messenger RNA, but contrary to my, my liking, most of the folks I see are less comfortable with messenger RNA because I think these may be uh, bad things. And they are more comfortable with adenovirus-based vaccines, which had been out there before, or even inactivated virus or Novavax-like uh, platform. Judy Jetson says, Dr. Me, have you heard about COVID nails? No, the red half moon sign. I have not. That's a very interesting one. It's a diagnostic tool. Hmm. So sometimes a diagnostic feature on the body sign, which can be only for one disease, we call it pathognomic. That means if you see that, then this is this disease, nothing else is possible that would cause that. So I don't, I don't know if it is pathognomic or it is just one of the signs. So DC says, I had J&J five months ago. No antibodies detected. Does that mean I don't have any protection? So good question. And again, I cannot comment on exactly what is happening in your body and your immune system. I'll tell you generally what happens is, let's say this is time scale. Here is some antigen that is given. That may be a vaccine. That may be a virus. Then four or five days later, we start making antibodies. In case of COVID infection, IgM and IgG has, are made together. Generally, IgM is made first, then it goes down first within a couple of weeks. IgG starts getting made within a few more days later. And then that IgG here in my diagram, which is kind of seems, then that IgG continues. Fourth month later, fourth, fifth, sixth month, everybody is different, but books say fourth month. Fourth month is when the antibodies start going down. The reason for that is that the cells that are making the antibodies, those cells would start becoming uh, apoptotic, they would die. 
and the memory cells will be formed. Those memory cells will be then kept in possibly three locations. Area of infection or area, let's say, of vaccine. That means local lymph nodes of the vaccine area. Lymph nodes themselves. And then third, maybe bone marrow as well, where long-lasting immunity cells would be living there. Three possible places. Sorry, lymph nodes, circulation, and bone marrow. Now, when the immune memory cells are formed, by that time, the antibodies start going down. So this means if somebody is testing themselves here, it is possible that they actually had the antibodies, then their immune system cells form the memory cells, active cells died out, now antibody levels are not sufficient to be detected but they have protection in terms of the memory cells. So T detect tests could be used. Then there could be another possibility and that is they actually never developed the antibodies. If they never developed the antibodies, then once again, there could be two outcomes. One, let's say the person actually do not have the capability of developing the immune response. That if a person is healthy is kind of not fathomable because immune system would respond. It, another possibility here could be that the, remember we have the innate arm. So let's say this is the innate arm. And that would be macrophage and um, natural killer cell and neutrophil and dendritic cells. Then the adaptive arm kicks in and we know that adaptive arm goes two possible routes. It can go T helper two pathway going to the humeral pathway which would make antibodies or it can go T helper 1 pathway which will go the uh, cytotoxic pathway which will start the CD8 T cells. <clears throat> now it is possible that in some people the predominant pathway on the acquired side is the cytotoxic pathway and if it is cytotoxic pathway they may not develop enough antibodies to show for it because they are innate arm plus cytotoxic arm is the primary dominant responder. In such cases, they would have protection but not have enough antibodies to show for it. So that means there are three possibilities. Number one, their antibodies have already waned, but their memory cells are present, which would protect. Number two, their, this is actually for children, this is also possible that their innate arm actually took care of majority of the problem. But number two, their T helper one, let's say for adults, their cytotoxic arm worked. And number three is they didn't develop protection at all. So if they didn't develop protection at all, there would be other issues that they may have as well. So these are various possibilities. There may be more, but these are the ones that come to my mind at this time. So Zerk has a very good question. If over time, COVID becomes less dangerous, deaths, hospitalizations due to evolutionary pressure, will long COVID also become less severe? Yes, short answer. Because ideally, and I think this is going to happen, ideally, SARS-CoV-2 is going to become a human coronavirus. At this time, it does not know us. It's a wild type for us. And so it is a zoonotic virus. And so it is killing us. But it is evolving. And usually that evolution is towards trying to live with us. Or only those evolutionary copies would be selected that would be more um, possible, have more potential to live. And these would be, would be those copies that our immune system is not trying to kill. So they would survive. If that happens, it could become a nuisance of creating common cold-like sy symptoms, maybe as severe like flu, so not as mild as common, you know, coronavirus kind of symptoms, which are milder. Maybe it would become milder. But because of this, all the diseases that it causes would all become milder as well. Th that's in theory.
Eric Dog, I wanted to. Uh, so I hope that the comment in the YouTube Eric Cat uh, are yours as well. So it was funny when I had the lion's mane and your quest, your comment was that Dr. Bean could end up with a bandage bean. So thank you for that fun comment. I giggled and laughed. Okay, so F. Ben Bow says, do you know which, which, do you know about retro transposons and pseudogenes and the possible significance in messenger RNA vaccines. No, but I would love to read if there is anything interesting. And if um, you are, I know where you are uh, picking this up from, uh, the reverse messenger RNA to DNA transcription and then um, integration into the DNA. Please remember that this messenger RNA has not been proven to be integrated in the DNA. But if there is something uh, which is a possible mechanism, I would love to see it. Alive in Heels says, how can one tell, would one know this in advance from prior reaction to infection? Um, sorry. How can one tell alive in heels? Uh, would one know this in advance? So maybe you asked this question in some context, which I moved on from. So tell me the context. Okay, so I'm going to... Okay, so Carol Lee says, can tumor necrosis factor blocker for rheumatoid arthritis impair immune response to vaccine. So the TNF blockers would generally try to modulate the immune response downwards. And for RA, let's say those cells that are more prone towards causing RNA, they are helping them. But generally, there will be some modulation downwards. Is it sufficient to cause non-vaccine competence, meaning once the vaccine comes in for training, it doesn't. I think that if the person is taking it in a dose where they are able to take care of all the rest of their uh, their needs for from the immune system, for example, um, if they have a cut they, that can heal fine without infections or infections are controlled, then vaccine would do its function as well. I would suspect that the dosage for TNF blockers will not be large to cause immunosuppression to the point that they cannot handle infections because that would create another issue for the patient. So if they can handle infections, they can then get training from a vaccine as well. Chris says, if I got the J&J vaccine back in April, is it safe to get the Pfizer booster? So again, I cannot give a personal advice. So please, this is not a personal advice. I'm going to go to what CDC said. CDC said anyone who has J&J vaccine, two months after the J&J, they can take a booster of J&J or other vaccines. So April, get the file. So April, I think it's more than two months. <laughs> so yes. Uh, again, not an not an answer, not an advice to you. Ge just generally from the CDC's point of view. DDS says my county just extended the mask mandate until the end of the year. New twist: no mask needed if everyone in the room is vaccinated. How can this be okay? So. So I'll put my bias out first so that if you wanted to dismiss my opinion, you could. And that is, I believe in masks. I, I understand that the masks nowadays, the cloth is not great. The material is not great. The wearing is not great. There is leaks everywhere. So I get it. But generally, if you talk about a mask of a good quality mask, they work. One. Second, um, mask mandate until end of the year outside if it is for outside that may be because there are folks who are vaccinated and unvaccinated i'm trying to explain 
for somebody's decision, which I do not know why they made it. And I'm just thinking aloud with you. So if it is a mixture of vaccinated and vaccinated, then mask may be necessary to actually protect more the unvaccinated. Then new twist, no mask needed if everyone in the room is vaccinated. That is because if everyone is vaccinated and let's say they can still exchange the virus, the possibility of a severe disease is less. I would say that if everyone in the room is vaccinated and has less severe outcome possible, even with vaccinate, vaccination, for example, somebody is not too old or too frail or does not have any cancers or bone marrow cancers or, or B cell or T cell cancers, if such patients or somebody who's on immunosuppressing therapy, somebody with the organ transplant, even if they are vaccinated, they may still need to be careful. So I think this could not be generalized or if it needs to be generalized, then we would assume that we are talking about healthy individuals who have lesser risk of becoming severe when they are vaccinated. So I'm going to see uh, Alive in Heels if there is a clarity in the question. <laughs> I think Alive in Heels is Rima. At least the picture seemed so. And I'm trying to see her if she is Rima. Okay. So Inside Out Beauty says, do you know about Medicago vaccine in Canada? Yes. So it is plant-based vaccine. I love the idea of it. I haven't yet got a, gotten more data or the trials yet, but it is an interesting vaccine. It's an in interesting uh, technology as well. <laughs> okay, so so Doug, this is uh, I suspect vaccinated are more likely to spread asymptomatically. Yes, it is possible exactly. However, we also know that unvaccinated also what there is eighty percent of the folks who get COVID don't develop symptoms. It's the twenty percent that. Uh, not 20%, more than 20%, 20% that end up in hospital. So there is a large swath of unvaccinated who are also asymptomatic. But you're correct, somebody who's vaccinated and their immune system is active, they would not even feel it. And so they could spread that, spread that and we've talked about it before as well. Um, now the question is, if an, a vaccinated person who may have a potential to spread the virus unknowingly and they are near an unvaccinated person, they may actually spread it to them. So then the possibility of protection is important. If these are all vaccinated, as I said before, and there is no serious risk within the vaccinated groups, then it, it is possible to not have, even if there is some exchange of virus, I think it, they can handle it. Bambi says, my husband and wife friends both have caught COVID-19 one week before their booster due. They run a pub and no mask wearing in England. In my opinion, masks and boosters needed. So they run a pub and no mask wearing in England. Okay. So they got, <laughs> they, uh, they got the infection. So they got the booster before the booster. My husband and why friends both have caught COVID-19 one week before their boosters are due. So tell me, I hope that they would be generally fine and they can then continue on. I, I don't know, does UK say that if you get the infection, then you still should go get the booster? DC says, or hospitals in Buffalo, New York area, near capacity, mask mandate now in effect, indoor everywhere. Interesting. 
<laughs> alive in hills is here. I usually sign on under my real name, Rima Van Hilsiel. So Rima, that, that question, I'm still, I'm so sorry I didn't catch the question. Uh, so give me some more data on that. Blank Blank says, are we winning, gaining ground, losing ground on bringing the truth forward about injuries? I feel like we are still losing. Um, so I was talking about this in the, uh, in the interview today as well. I think this is being ignored a lot. Let's be on the same page and say, fine, these may be rare, but they are there. People are suffering. There is a real, real damage that is happening. And acknowledging that that is happening should then result in figuring out how to help and how to help better how to be aggressive about quickly helping instead of letting it simmer and making people's life or letting the people's life be miserable for a long time. That I think is unfortunate that that is not happening. But look at this. I mean, people are being attacked right now who are talking about it their accounts are shut down, they're, they're getting in trouble everywhere, complaints everywhere. So it's just very strange time. Joanne says, are there actual numbers for rare of the adverse events? So look, this is where it becomes a discussion point as well. And this is where if there was actual data provided to which we were all agreeing on, it would have been better. Think about it for a second. You're um, putting the word rare in quotations kind of tells me that you are saying, hey, not really rare. Now think about it for one second. Imagine if the healthcare, our healthcare in the US, the leaders of the health healthcare had asked everyone who is from various camps, vaccine camps, anti-vaccine camp, vaccine injury camp, vaccine hesitancy, ask them all to come in and have a dialogue, have a discussion, have a monthly dinner or lunch. So you, you sit down together, you eat together, you discuss various problems, you discuss your observations. Then you come out and you say, hey, all of us, those who like vaccines, those who do not like vaccines, those who are seeing injuries, those who are seeing some other things, we all came together, we exchanged our ideas, we looked at some data, here is our note to the public that here is how we are on the same page, here is what we are doing, here is what we are not doing. If there was something like that, it would create so much confidence in public. Instead of saying, you go get the vaccine or you're out. Instead of that, if this was that, hey, let's sit down together. Let's talk about it. No dispute, no disagreements, no attacks. Let's talk about it. Let's see what is being seen. Let's verify if it is really correct or not. Mubin comes in and says there is injuries and, and somebody else says, no, there is not. And then they just look at it together, the data. So same way, Joanne, to answer your question, my data points are what I see on the official sites. The reason is when I look at unofficial sites, for example, there are so many bloggers nowadays who have been putting data out and they say that, hey, they, I saw a note a few days ago where somebody actually said vaccines are not working at all. And they had done data smithing to say, look, I can show you with the data. So I think more than numbers is what is it that we would all agree on. Now, public is left. We are left on our own devices to figure out with each other that what will we agree on. This should have been 
at a higher level. There should all representatives be. They should come out and say, we all agree that this is the data that we would be looking at. And we all agreed that we looked at that data together today. And this is what we think is the st state, the situation. Till that happens, I have seen so many communications, fights between people. One person says, this is the data that is correct. And the other one says, how do you think it is correct? And then the other one says, this is what I think is correct. And this one says, so I understand your assertion, your challenge. For me, the data from Israel, data from UK, data from CDC site, from other places, from VAERS. Now, the problem with VAERS is that verified data is still a problem. Ideally, there should have been a way to give verified data out. So there is a problem with the data. There's a problem with the healthcare pandemic management leadership. I'm not talking about just general leadership, but there should have been some task forces for managing the pandemic, and they should have done all of this. So Lucy Ant says, excellent idea. I hope you're talking about my idea. <laughs> so Devin says, how do we know that vaccinating healthy young people is much better than gaining natural immunity? Any data to that? So see, a few days ago when the children were, so I think that was 5 to 12 or 5 to 11, when that was approved, vaccine was approved for them. At that time in the CDC's or FDA's document that I went over, many parts of the data were extrapolated because they said we don't have data for this. So this is an area where I think that this question that where is the data and how do we compare that data? The comparisons that they had done were in multiple scenarios. They created various models, did the projections, and then came back and they said, here are, according to the projections, there is benefit. I think there needed to be some more rigor in there. So simply Q style says, does the D-dimer blood test prove new blood clots in the body? So D-dimer simply means there are clots and these are being broken down. So what happens is, um, if I can quickly draw it. So let's say here is a platelet and one more platelet and one more platelet and one more platelet and so on. And they are having fun. They're just flying around in our blood vessels. Then at some point they get triggered, they become activated, and there are many ways they become activated. And once they are activated, they start clumping. Let's say there is an injury here on the vessel wall, a cut or something or inflammation or in SARS-CoV-2 or spike protein or something, something that causes inflammation. Now these platelets start collecting here. And what we do is our body it wants the platelets to stay here, to make a plug here. The problem is that these fly away because the, the blood is like a running stream. So any, anything in there would just sw be, be swept away. So we tie them together with ropes. But it is very interesting that within this fibers, that are now wrapped around the platelet. We also put scissors in there, which will become active a few days later and cut the ropes and remove the plaque. That is how our body internally handles the clot formation and clot removal. Externally, the clots are formed and then they fall off. 
here internally we have to dissolve them we cannot just have them fall off and go get stuck somewhere so the scissors are also here then two three days later the scissors would cut these ropes those small pieces the cut pieces are called d-dimers now there is always a level of clotting happening in all of us that means there's always some level of d-dimers always present and our body keeps them in a way that it doesn't hurt us but when d-dimers go above the normal levels that means there was for sure clotting occurring and those clots are being dissolved and d-dimers are being produced so yes <laughs> so somebody said i do not know what the discussion was boot burner says great idea inside out beauty but that they won't accept dr bean as he's not a psychopath so must be an interesting discussion going on okay um i'm gonna see if there are some more questions on the Uh, on the Twitter side as well. How is everyone doing? So we're having, we, we become so businessy all the time that we come in, we start answering questions and that's it. We don't ask how is everyone. So I'm gonna, William, you have a, lots of very reasonable, very well articulated comments and questions and I would keep answering them. I was thinking by reading them all, I was thinking I should just do one session and answer all of them in that one session. So I'm not ignoring them, it's just that I wanna give chance to others as well. So, okay, so Greg Olson says, I don't want to take the vaccine because I don't think I need it. I'm mostly healthy, my family is mostly healthy and if I get COVID, I can get early treatment. That is about it. So Greg, fine, that is your choice. I would not, um, I don't have a right to ask you one way or the other. Even sometimes healthy individuals do get in a little intense fight with the COVID and sometimes long haul occurs. So as long as you're comfortable that you have all the right mechanisms in place, it, this is a risk not worth taking. And I also understand that on the vaccine side, my own family, my wife has had uh, side effects for a long time. So I understand that part. Louis Gers says, why take the vaccine if we have ivermectin as, as a prophylactic? I wonder why the need for a vaccine if its ingredients are still a mystery. So multiple um, questions or comments or so number one ivermectin is also not 100 percent so we can still end up in problem that's one second i think it is not possible just to say a vaccine would declare no ingredients and get away with it the companies will have to disclose the ingredients that is part of the approval process now could we assert that they are lying maybe but generally from an honest work point of view the drug has to disclose all the ingredients it may be that we do not know which ingredient would do what that's a different thing the trials and the doses and the side effects and the benefit is for that but they have to disclose ingredients. Effie Scrow says, I am Effie Scrow. I am certain that I acquired COVID at the hospital for a routine dental procedure in Feb 2019. 2019 February? Natural immunity is my reason for not getting the leaky injections. Feb 2019. Did you mean 2020? 
So, but let's assume that you feel that you had COVID. The common cold could be for many reasons. And just please make sure that you are comfortable, that you have done your testing and everything. It, it's not worth taking the risk. Okay, so here on this side. What? There is a discussion of engines going on. Colombian Bean says, Skyfrog, what are you building? Just checked my son's progress. It's looking good. Still waiting on the engine. What are you guys building? <laughs> I want to go build it too. Okay, so... Zerk, Zerk says, any evidence pointing to potential antigenic imprinting where infection in those with antibodies from vaccine recovery both will give worse outcomes than those with COVID naive immune systems. There is no such mechanism proven. This is a theory I know who started it. So the idea that's just like original antigenic sin as well, that somehow the initial exposure will then cause the next exposure to be not very well handled. That is not proven. It has been said by many, but it's not proven. It's not seen. Simply Q style says, worried for my son who got vaccinated and showed symptoms of blood clots in the brain. Very sorry to hear that. And this is, this is what I feel that healthcare authorities, people who are in the decision-making places, I can't make those decisions, right? People who are in the decision-making places, this is their job to focus on these things make healthcare professionals aware of them, then say, here is the protocols, then tell the patient how to manage all this. So simply, Q, I hope that your son recovers without any issues and recovers quickly. <laughs> Barbara says, and Lotus says, I think Skyfrog is building a plane or a spacecraft. Skyfrog, uh, Skyfrog, are you trying to go to Mars before Elon Musk is by building an engine? <laughs> Skyfrog says airplane. Okay. Okay, got it. So Brian K says, Circulation Journal has a new abstract that has people bent out of shape. Can you explain why a medical journal would publish an abstract that is just a presentation given at a scientific session? I have no idea actually what that is. So um, what should I look for? So did they, actually there is no paper, this is just an abstract? published ahead of print. Is this what we're talking about? But this has some data here. Um, tell me a little more, Brian. Okay, so there is a question by someone. Nairi Petr Petrosian says, Dr. Bean, pardon me, did you say we need booster now every year? My intent, internet is shutting in and out. So if you ask me, I'm gonna give you, so let me give you a short answer, no. And before the 
reviewers shut this channel down because I said no. Let me explain the mechanism. It has become so difficult to have a reasonable dialogue without someone becoming upset. So, booster, the question. I'm going to give you some ideas from the, look, let me back up first. We, none of us has seen, including scientists, including us, none of us has seen what would happen in two years, correct? How will our immunity be in two years? We have not. We can only look at the past. We can only look at the repeated verifiable information and mechanisms that are in textbooks, that are taught, that are fundamentals. Just like two plus two equals four, there are fundamentals of medicine as well. So I'm going to talk about those for a second. We know that for SARS-CoV-1, or even before that, when an antigen arrives in our body, when an antigen arrives in our body, so that could be um, a virus, a bacteria, a fungus, another organ, a transplant, a blood donation, something, when an antigen arrives in our body, our body responds to it and tries to eliminate that. And we know that that response starts within four or five days where first the innate arm attacks it, which is immediate. Innate arms immediate means within one day. And then the acquired arm gets triggered. And that is usually five days. It could be more and less. And then for a few weeks, the acquired arm makes antibodies or activates a cytotoxic T cell, cytotoxic T cell pathway, or a mixture of both pathways. Then what happens is that creates antibodies. Then at some point, antibodies wane off, usually four months, correct? But memory cells are formed. These memory cells, let me see if I can make a nice memory cell. If this is a brain, <laughs> I'm gonna, so, so sorry, please let me draw something that would make me feel like having fun. So this is a cell with the brain in it. So this is, <laughs> this is a memory cell. So the memory cells are really just the cells that have been given the mission of waking up later, correct? And so those go in the circulation or in the area of infection, local lymph nodes or in the bone marrow or all three places. Then they sit there for some time. Now, how long do they sit there? Is that time of immunity or protection incurred by memory system? Number one. Number two, it is possible that memory system itself fails if the virus or the pathogen changes so much that the memory cannot recognize it. For example, flu virus. Many people say to me in comments that we cannot handle flu virus. What makes you think we can handle SARS-CoV-2? The problem is SARS-CoV-2 has a, um, an enzyme in it, which is called a proofreader, which tries to make sure that the genetic material does not drift away too much and it stays stable. Because of that, SARS-CoV-2's antigens or structure is usually stable compared to flu, although it has thousands and thousands of variants too, but still stable. That means when we develop memory against it, it can attack it. Flu viruses drift and shift causes our memory to fail all the time. Now, this is the general mechanism. If the memory cells go and they start living in the bone marrow, so let's say this is a bone and this is the marrow in it. If they start living in the bone marrow, bone marrow plasma cell, then it is possible that the bone marrow, the plasma cell living in the bone marrow that are B cells making antibodies could be there for years and they incur long-term immunity. So with all this knowledge in the back of our mind, now I'm gonna to go to SARS-CoV-1, one, not two. So now I'm going to go to 
past to see if he can learn something from there. SARS-CoV-1 showed, so they did trials on the people who were infected with SARS-CoV-1. The immunity, the B cell immunity or humoral immunity continued for two years and then waned in third year or reduced in third year. And the T cell memory, that is T helper cells, stayed even till 10 years. This is SARS-CoV-1. Now SARS-CoV-2 is a cousin of SARS-CoV-1. They are, I think, more than 86% similar. That means, plus they both are coronaviruses, their structures are very similar. If we take lesson from SARS-CoV-1, then protection given to this should also go for two years or even 10 years of memory protection through T-cells. The question to answer, the unknown in this, of course, the whole thing is unknown if we don't, don't take the past as an example. The unknown is, will vaccine be also doing this? And that is where what they need to do is to look at vaccine-generated memory cells and see where do they sit. Can we detect them in bone marrow? If so, then vaccine would have given long-term immunity as well. Antibody is not a great way of saying, do we have protection or not? because we know antibodies are going to wane anyways. That is a normal behavior. So, so much of the background to answer this question that do we say that we're gonna get booster every year? The answer, if we trust that it is a coronavirus and it is going to behave like that, if we trust that we can develop long-term immunity against coronaviruses, then generally we may not need boosters every year. This is a general statement. Now, where could booster come in? Not every year, but here we are, we are seeing companies saying, and our healthcare administration saying every six months, or at least six months later, may not be every six months, but they may be saying, we need at least three doses to create then the long-term immunity they may actually come back after six months and say, no, 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 we need a fourth. So repeated booster is an unknown. But if we are saying that any time immunity wanes, we are going to rush for a booster, then it seems like with certain vaccines, we will need booster every six months. Now, in some cases, this may be okay. Somebody who's a cancer patient, somebody who's so fragile that they cannot mount and continue to mount a good re response. Or when the virus is, um, when they're exposed to the virus and the immune system starts within two, three days and they don't have that time to, uh, the virus can cause more damage to them while the immune system is coming up. They may need continuous boosters by continuous, I mean every six months or a year, to keep their immune system up to a normal, healthy, active state to protect them. But that is, these are exceptions and selective cases. So this is how I see it. So to answer your question, no, I don't know. Will it be yearly? Will it be six monthly? Will these become a mandated booster or not? I hope not because from mechanism point of views, these should not be. So what is the place to make a decision? The decision should not be based on waning of the immunity or antibodies. Decision should be based on, do we see long-term memory cells sitting in bone marrow, one. Or second is decision could be made on the observational studies as we are seeing now more and more, where they said here is a person who is vaccinated it is a person who is not vaccinated. So immediately for six months, here is a difference. After six months, here is a difference. For example, after six months, no difference. So those studies would also tell us what's happening.
So Art Ninjiok says, do the protective mechanism of nicotinamide mononucleoside nucleotide help reduce myelin sheath damage and is nicotine related to NMN and do nicotine paths help? So I know that there is a role of the nicotinamide. What I do not know is nicotine, nicotinamide, exactly how much of the effect on the myelin sheath. I'll have to do some research. Good question. I have to research. I don't want to speak out of turn. Okay, so Skyfrog sent you a DM on Discord of Sun's RV8 build. Awesome, thank you very much. I'll check it out. VAS Vas says, what if a person is healthy to not get infected? Why is a healthy person required to go through an invasive medical procedure just because someone says so? So the only reason, so I don't want to explain somebody else's decision where I may have my own hesitations. So then when I explain it, it looks <clears throat> like I'm, I'm justifying them or somebody else. But generally, the only vaccine's need will be, for example, why did I get it? With vaccine, there is a chance of side effect injury. With COVID, there is. So what a dangerous time to live in that you have to make a take a gamble to say, I don't want to face the virus to protect myself. I'm going to face this vaccine, which can also damage me. And then the chances of damage are less here so I'm going to take it. That is the kind of uh, decision making that is happening. It's a dangerous time for us. So could there be better formulas or hierarchies for vaccine? Yes. And I find it strange. And this is now my opinion part. Somebody said in comments on YouTube that Dr. Bean is, <laughs> is a great teacher, but when he pre presents his his comment is wrong, so maybe I'm wrong. But if you look at the boosters, the FDA's last Friday's booster approval, they said we wanted to simplify the decision making by saying everybody gets a booster. I think we should have made it more, more hierarchical, more thought out. It would not cause confusion. We are able to think about the from the table and hierarchies and the flow charts. Our doctors are able to think that way as well. It's not a matter of just simplifying to say everybody gets a booster. We could have been given those choices to say, if you are at risk, and here are the things that mean at risk, then choose a booster. If you are not at risk, and here is what we mean by not at risk, then don't, you can avoid a booster, you can skip a booster. My worry is that the next step could be, first you say everybody is eligible for the booster, the next step could be now we mandate everyone to have a booster. So that's, that's just how things are panning out. Grass says, how likely is it in your opinion that mRNA vaccines, unlike most other standard vaccines, will have long-term serious negative side effects only exposed years after vaccination? So I'm gonna give you my opinion. <laughs> and why I'm laughing is I remembered that comment that said, Dr. Mubin is a great teacher, but as soon as he gives his I'm paraphrasing, his opinion is wrong. So I may be wrong. RNA is nothing new for us. Our cells 
all the time our cells only work with rna so for example let's use this and somebody had made a comment that vaccines are the only one that are sending in messages from outside that cause cell to do something well if you take steroid that is what it does what does steroid do when we take steroids steroids would go all the way in the plasma then bind there to steroid carrying proteins and those proteins would carry the steroid in the nucleus and then steroids would go and attach to the steroid binding elements there and then open certain genes to make messenger rna that would come out and then messenger rna would work with ribosome to make a certain protein and that is the effect of a steroid this is all the way to the nucleus so it is not that we don't have drugs or we don't have therapies that go and tell the cell everything tells the cell to do something steroid actually directly modulate the dna and genes um, there are other cells for example insulin when you give that now it does not go and modulate the gene but it would attach with the insulin receptor which would cause second messenger which would then eventually cause production of the uh, glute um, channels and their extrusion to the cell surface my point is therapies include things that would go and tell cell what to do you could make this argument that we didn't have therapies which have messenger rna as a commanding system that goes into the cell and instead of telling the cell what to do it itself is the command that directly works with the cells cook the ribosome and makes a protein that cell didn't even think and know to make and then that protein does things that's different that's new now uh, to go back to your question our cells are used to working with rna so what happens is any time any cell that wants to do something the dna would open up that dna would create an rna that messenger rna will come out that would then then attach to ribosome ribosome would create a protein the the first phase is transcription then is a translation then the protein will be formed and that protein would do something now what tells me that the messenger rna sent from outside is similar because if it was not similar it will not engage with our ribosome it has to be similar in structural um, build out to our messenger rnas so that it can work with our machinery this is like if you have a car or we're talking about sky frog and and the plane and the engine so let's say there is a plane and <laughs> a sky frog i have no idea about the plane so i'm going to give a wrong example but let's say there is a plane and in that plane we try to put a motor bikes engine and we say now this engine should be good to fly it or in a small two seater plane we try to put a jet engine and say that is going to fly it and you can know that that would not work very well similarly if we sent in messenger rna that actually didn't work well with our machinery then that messenger rna would be destroyed it won't work so we have made it to work with it that means it is similar to what our cells are used to seeing every day now our cells are used to seeing messenger rna every moment right now we are all making tons of messenger rna in every cell which is coming out making proteins and cells are functioning these messenger rnas will be destroyed in a few hours and then they would be degraded their building blocks would be reused and so on so this is a cycle that continues any messenger rna that would come from outside would meet the same fate number 1 number 2 the folks who are saying that this would create a issue 2 years 3 years down the road they are taking lot of liberties with their mechanisms which are not possible for example the first liberty they are taking is that they are saying hopefully they know that messenger rna cannot live on for 3 years hidden somewhere in a nook or a crony of a cell so they are saying well it's going to become reversed into complement dna that would then go into the cell and get integrated into the dna 
then that DNA would express these spike proteins, for example, but our body would not react to it. Then when sometimes we will be exposed to the, to the virus, then our body would react to it and kill this cell. That's a lot of uh, mechanisms that are not possible. First, the messenger RNA would not integrate into DNA. If that was happening, imagine our own cells that are making tons of messenger RNA all the time are just reintegrating back into the DNA. Our DNA would just keep becoming bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and die. Number two, if external DNA, complement DNA, goes into our cell and becomes integrated, our DNA would be short. Then you can ask this question that how would CRISPR technology work? Because that is also going to manipulate the DNA. CRISPR is going to create DNA changes which would actually repair the DNA. These are not foreign DNA materials added. These are normal DNA pieces added. But if you went in and increased, this is like somebody comes in to your kitchen and uh, with your stove adds one more stove. And you look at that and say, what the heck is this? But if somebody, if a stove was not working, if a burner was not working and somebody repaired it, you'll say, yeah, that's fine. These are the um, talking high level. So we will have to do a lot of provisions to allow this kind of outcome to happen. And that would not happen. If the cell is changed, it's going to die or it's going to become cancer right away. It's not going to stay dormant for two, three years and then become active. There is no such uh, mechanism yet to do that. Philip says, thank you again for taking the time to answer questions and open a dialogue for us to discuss. Great deal of courage you have. Much of, you're very welcome. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Uh, there was one more super chat. I wanted to see if I can. Philip Lewis says, there is only one answer in this matter of time. More time is needed, in my opinion, on the matter of time. Why is Pfizer wanting to make their trial and experimental data confidential for 55 years? Should I wait 55 years before making my decisions based on the data? So very good question. And I commented on that yesterday as well. If you... Uh, and thank you very much for <laughs> generous donations. If you look at the, the article, what they said was, FDA said was, we only have 10 employees who are working on Freedom of Information Act. We have 300,900 something pages of data that needs, needs to be anonymized, redacted, process to be given out. I, I buy that a little less because they processed all that data for trial results as well. But fine, all of that data needs to be anonymized, name, social security, address, everything needs to be removed. Um, some other pieces need to be redacted. Fine. So they're saying we can only process with these 10 people who are also serving other FYA requests, Freedom of Information Act requests, and they are overwhelmed, they are overworked, so they can only do 500 pages per month. And when you divide 300 some thousand pages by 500, it would take 55 years. To me, here is how it seems. Imagine we were running FDA. If our team came in and said, we are 2,000 people in total, we only have 10 people, and we cannot, in a reasonable time, do this request. My message will not be, our message will not be, hey, we can't do it, we need 50 years, because that seems like stalling, that seems like delaying, that seems like hiding something. Instead, I would have gone back and said, I need more budget, I need more people. This is the data. I'm showing you a sample. Here are two pages. I have redacted them. I've anonymized them. I have to do this to 300,000 pages. And to do that, I need this much of people. I am sure that 
that budget can be acquired, I'm sure that there are many ways to do that. I think that should have been the discussion to say, instead of 10 people, I need 1,000 people on it. And if you give me 1,000 people, we'll do it in two months. And for 1,000 people, here is a budget needed. Or give me 100 people and we'll do it in five years. Here is the budget needed. Or if we do this, I'm sure that there are computer softwares as well that could be written to do all of that. So um, again, this is just I don't know what the thinking is. If the thinking is they really don't need this data, they're just being fussy with us. So we're just going to say we don't have resources. If they really want to engage with the public, we are we are one people, right? They are not someone else and we are not someone else. If they would say, well, let's provide them the data, and then they could have done this. Yeah, Sue says, hire temps. I would say volunteers, if they said today that, hey, we would run uh, you know, security checks on you, we would clear you for security level this, and if you're cleared, come in volunteer for one month and help with this. I will go and say, I'll volunteer. So I think there are many ways to do it. I think that these kind of requests are an opportunity for the organization to engage with the public to say, we are with you. You're asking for this, let's do it together. Instead of looking a little less um, flexible. Duran Senior says, do you think the Novavax could potentially cause the same DNA damage in cells from the spike protein as what was seen with the actual COVID-19 virus and mRNA vaccine Stockholm University study? So I explain it almost daily. That was a Frankenstein in vitro cell created to, struct, to show those results. It is not shown with the vaccine. It is not shown with the COVID. It is not possible in, in vivo. So because of that, Novavax is not even a question. But let's say we take your uh, message in this way that let's say it is happening. Then what we are saying is spike protein's presence inside the cell does it. If the spike protein is present outside the cell, it will not do it. Here is why. The spike protein, let's say this is the edible arrangement. So happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Edible arrangement of spike proteins, right? And this is outside a cell. This cell is not going to pick it up. Normal, casual, common cell is not going to pick it up, but an immune cell will pick it up, right? However, when an immune cell picks it up, it's not going to just pick it up and bring it inside of its cytoplasm and spike protein is now going to start running around. It's going to pick it up as a phagocytic vacuole. Our cells are very, very clever. When they eat up something, they package it up into a wrapping and bring it in and then they digest it. They make a tiny stomach in which they bring it. Then they attach the acids or lysosomes to this phagosome. So phagolysosome is formed, which then breaks down the components and then those components are loaded onto the MHC2 and its other things and or MHC1 and then shown outside. So if this was happening, then Novavax doesn't have that mechanism because the spike protein will not be running around in the cell. But even if we said it was happening, even with the messenger RNA vaccine or adenovirus-based vaccines, the spike proteins that are produced are kept in vesicles, first in the endoplasmic reticulum, then in the Golgi operators, then in the endosome and shredded and loaded on the, on the MSC1 and 2. So these are not really just free to run around. But because the researchers created those Frankenstein cells in which they could produce it, potentially this could happen in vitro, could be repeated as well, but in vivo, we don't have this happening because virus also does not infect B cells. So very, very far-fetched idea. Interesting idea. They did good research.
Okay, so 736. Let's take one more question. VS says, is there a test to detect memory cells to prove immunity? T detect. T detect. Doug says, happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving to you as well. So on the matter of Thanksgiving, on the matter of Thanksgiving, uh, we'll do a lecture tomorrow and then I'll take off Thanksgiving and day after. Then I'll combine that with the weekend and yay, I'll have four days off. Um, I'll try to every once in a while ping you and show you some paintings and stuff. So um, with this, we will keep continuing with these talks to be able to answer as much as we can. And we, when I say we, it is all of us together and we'll go from there. So please do me a favor, please like, subscribe and share. And if you would like to um, support this work, there are links in the description. You can buy me a coffee or you can be a patron or you can use PayPal. Thank you very much. Happy Thanksgiving. If I didn't see you tomorrow, otherwise I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.